It is called the Alhambra. The Alhambra is perhaps the most famous example of, of Islamic architecture to, to most Westerners. It is the, the best remaining example of what a medieval Muslim palace would have looked like. Echoed in the finely carved geometric plaster work and marble pillars is a vanished lifestyle of extraordinary luxury. The Alhambra reveals the pinnacle of Islamic culture and urbanity. The beauty of the Alhambra is not so much in the individual details. No, it's more the combination of everything. That is, this wonderful um, sort of orchestrated interplay of different textures and surfaces of light and space and water playing inside and outside of, of buildings. It's almost like a symphony of different elements that are very carefully brought together to provide exquisite enjoyment. Here, the Muslim elite relished the good life. Reposing on lush carpets, surrounded by perfume and music, the privileged few debated the nature of God, the subtleties of Greek philosophy, or the most recent mathematical revelations from India, while they dined on spiced delicacies served on Chinese porcelains. They strolled the grounds through gardens irrigated by complex gravity-fed water systems. How far Muhammad's followers had come from the life of desert nomads. How distant they felt from the rest of the European continent they now shared. Christian Europe, due north, was struggling on through the Dark Ages. But at the dawn of the 11th century, a tragedy in Jerusalem would put Muslims and European Christians on a collision course. Jerusalem was ruled by an Egyptian caliph, an infamous man named Al-Hakim. Al-Hakim was certainly a deviation from the norm. Clinically speaking, I suppose today we'd regard him as a madman, as someone who was simply insane. For 200 years, Christian holy places in Jerusalem had been respected and protected by Muslim rulers. In 1009, the Egyptian ruler, Al-Hakim, broke with that tradition. He ordered the holiest church in Christendom destroyed. And horror of horrors, he burnt down the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Now, nobody knows quite why he did it, and you can have your own theories about it, but... Uh, the fact of the matter was that that sent shivers of terror and anxiety through Christendom. In a way, of course, Al-Hakim was the one exception that proved the rule for Christians that Christians had been speaking of for centuries, of Muslims as intolerant, mad, uh, uh, slavering heretics who simply could not uh, be expected to abide by the rules of civilized human beings. The fact that Al-Hakim's successor um, rebuilt the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it was done by 1048 with Byzantine help, didn't cut any ice. Um, there was this perception now that things were not going well in the Holy Land. In Europe, anti-Muslim sentiment simmered. 
by 1095, it reached the boiling point. Pope Urban II spent most of that year traveling through France, imploring his feudal lords to unite in a campaign of bloodshed. Hasten to exterminate this vile race from the lands of your eastern brethren, the Pope demanded. Jerusalem is the navel of the world. She cries out to be liberated. Christ himself commands it. So we've got a merging or a, a coming together of uh, military service and religion, which uh, served the purposes, if you like, of a pope who in 1095 made his famous call to crusade to rescue the endangered holy places um, in the east, and in particular, Jerusalem. In 1097, Muslim shepherds in Syria caught their first glimpse of a sight that would soon strike terror throughout the Holy Land. When the Crusaders struck, by sheer chance, the Arab Empire was at its most vulnerable, broken into feuding kingdoms and petty dynasties. They couldn't have chosen a better moment because the Muslim world was in a very fragmented state. The, the great rulers of the time had died, and into that power vacuum there came this most unexpected enemy, the Crusaders from Western Europe. Who would have thought that a new enemy would come to the Islamic world from that unexpected quarter? It was completely unprecedented. It was a real surprise. The Muslims didn't really know who they were. They thought they were just another lot of Byzantines who were coming as usual to be a nuisance and, and fight on the borders. They had no idea that there was this extraordinary surge of religious fervor and fanaticism coming from Western Europe and that the aim of this group was Jerusalem. History is haunted by days of incomprehensible horror. Few are darker than July 15, 1099, when the Crusaders entered Jerusalem. The massacre must have been terrible. The, 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 the fear, the fleeing of the population, It must have been horrendous. From a letter to the Pope from the Crusaders. If you want to know what was done to the enemies we found in the city, know this. Our men rode in the blood of the Saracens up to the knees of their horses. They saw the holy city and they were in a state of exultation. And perhaps that's why, when they flooded through the um, gates of the city, that they were fired up with fanaticism and zeal, and that's why there was this terrible massacre in the name of Christendom. It was a blot on the name of Christendom in the Muslim view, and justifiably so. Even Christians weren't spared. At the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, dozens of worshippers from Eastern sects were massacred. To the Crusaders, they were nothing more than foreigners. The Christian chronicles record the carnage. The Saracens, who were still alive, dragged the dead ones out and made huge piles of them. Such a slaughter of pagans, no one has ever seen or heard of. The pyres they made were like pyramids. They shocked the Muslim world when they came. There are a number of extremely moving 
lamentations in poetry.